Okay, who has chores that they have to do at home? Hmm? Yeah? What do you have to do? do the dishes. Dishes? Laundry. Laundry? Dishes. Dishes? dishes. dishes? Oh boy, lots of dishes. No one has to take the garbage out? Wow. Oh, okay, okay. Anyone get an allowance for that? No? No? Boy, you guys need better union rep, really. <laughs> well, how about if every time you did the dishes, you got paid per dish? That sound like a good deal? Yeah? Yeah? How about, how about we're going to give you a dime per dish? Yeah, about 10, 15 dishes a day when you're doing that, right? Buck 50 a day. Not bad, huh? Who's in favor? All in favor, say aye. You guys got to learn to be better Methodists than that. All in favor, say aye. There you go. Okay, now, let's see. So, you're doing the dishes. You work all that. We count up the dishes. You made two dollars and fifty cents, and we're give it, gonna give it to your younger brother too. No, no. Anyone else think that's fair? That's unfair. No, no one thinks that's fair. You know, we've got a story in the Bible where something exactly like that happened. There was a man who went to the center of town and he had a vineyard and he hired the three of you first thing in the morning. It's 6 a.m. Why you're up at 6 a.m. sitting around the park, I don't know. But you're there. And so he goes, tell you what, you come and you work in my vineyard and I'll pay you what you're worth. That sound like a deal? So you jump in the truck, he drives off, takes you to the vineyard, and you start picking. But you know what? There's lots of grapes out there. You're not going to get them all. So at noon, you guys have been working six hours. At noon, I go back to the city, and you guys are sitting there. And I say, hey, how about, how about you come and pick grapes in my vineyard, and I'll pay you what you're worth. Right? Okay, so you jump in the back of the truck, we get out there, and, and you, you pick, pick, Six more hours. That sound good? All right? But, you know, at 3 o'clock, we still haven't finished this. We aren't getting close, so I go back to the city square. I pick you all up. I say, come pick, a, pick grapes in my vineyard, all right? And we all come out, and, and finally, we're all done. And all the grapes got picked, so it's time to pay you. So I pay you each $2.50 for working for three hours in my vineyard. Is that good? Nah, you probably want more. Tell you what, I'll give you 10 bucks. You get 10 bucks for working my vineyard for three hours, okay? And I'll pay you guys 10 bucks too. And I'm going to give you the same 10 bucks. That sound fair? No? No? Why not? What? But I still only make you know, five cents a grape. But you pick more grapes. Yeah, that's right. That's what sounds fair. But you know what? Jesus said that's not how it works. Jesus said that's not how it works. I give you all the same amount. I give you all the same amount. Because the first will be last, and the last will be first. Because whatever we put value to, is equal in the eyes of God. So the things that we think are really important, sometimes not so much. And yet the littlest things, the smallest things, the simplest things, mean so much more. Who would rather have $10 or the love of a good friend? Which would you rather have? The friend? The friend? Yeah. But the world says we'd rather have the money. The world says we put our 
values in the wrong places. And what we need to be about is the idea of what God thinks is important. Things like forgiveness and love and grace. And can I give more love to one than another? If you all work in my vineyard, can I love you nine hours more than I love them? No. No. Because for God, our values are usually upside down. The first will be last. The last will be first. Try and remember that this week. When things don't seem fair, maybe, maybe we're looking at it wrong. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your value in the world, the way you look at things, the way that the smallest child, infant, baby is just as deserving of all the love in the world and all the grace and all the forgiveness as if we had lived a hundred years under your protection. That you love us that much. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming up here tonight. Money makes the world go round. Money is the scorecard of capitalism. Money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is. Money does not grow on trees. A fool and his money are soon parted. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'd like to be a poor man with lots and lots of money. A man is usually more careful with his money than his principles. Money cannot buy you love, but it improves your bargaining position. Money is better than poverty, if only for financial reasons. If you can count your money, you do not have a billion dollars. They give you cash, which is just as good as money. Don't think that money is everything, or you'll end up doing everything for money. Too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they do not want to impress people they do not like. Money. The point is that all of those sayings have a very grain of truth within them, and that's what makes those and countless other statements of about value and wealth and possessions and all the other labels that we use that don't actually use the word money and make them just a little true. As we enter into that part of the calendar where we are forced by the constructs of practicality to be involved in pledge campaigns, we have to talk about money which many of us, most of us, tend to find distasteful in the life of the church. And yet money, wealth, value, exchange are basic elements of nearly every story Jesus ever told. Because what is true now is just as true then. We show our heart by where we place our treasure. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's just the way it is. Okay, I know I'm picking on the youth a lot today. I need a confirmation kid. One that's close by the front row. Come on, one of you. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. It'll be shorter than just sitting there thinking about it. All right, there we go. 
Say your name nice and loud so everyone knows who you are. Kirsten. Kirsten. And, and you're going to join the church. And that means you're going to have to stand up here and take some vows, right? And you've studied all those greatly so far. Not so much. Yeah, you're going to make lots of promises. But here's the one I want you. I want you to read right there what you've got a promise to do. Will you be... Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and in your service? There you go. Very good. See? Get extra credit for today. Make sure your teacher knows that. Thank you. Now, the confirmation kids have to make that pledge because it's the same pledge each of you made somewhere along the line joining this church. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church? Uphold it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, meaning your money, and your service. Hold on to that thought, because we're going to be coming back to it. But first, let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills, whence cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord, who makes heaven and earth Grant a blessing on this time spent that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. The story of Ruth is one of those that should be somewhat familiar with us. But just in case it's not, let me give you the Reader's Digest version of what's happened so far. It's somewhere in that time between the judges who ruled in part or in whole the tribes of Israel and that time when they solidified under a king, the first king, King Saul. Something forces one family to leave the area inhabited by the tribes and go back to Moab. This family consists of Naomi as the matriarch her husband, and her two sons. And when they arrive in Moab, both of the sons marry young ladies from Moab. But soon after arriving, Naomi's husband dies. And soon after each of the marriages, each of the sons die, leaving Naomi with nothing and no one. Grief-stricken and bitter, she sends her newly widowed daughter-in-laws away as they are both still young and can remarry. One leaves, but the other refuses. Ruth, our protagonist and heroine, stays and makes a promise. Your people will become my people, and where you go, I will go. So the thing not to lose from this early part of the story is that our protagonist and heroine is not Hebrew. She's Moabite. At the same time, recall that Moab is the place where Moses flees when he escapes Egypt after murdering the overseer. Moses then marries a Moabite woman who bears him a son. And it is to the well of his father-in-law in Moab that the Hebrews go to after they have crossed the Red Sea and before they go to the mountain to receive the commandments. Ruth is a foreigner to the Hebrews. But it's not like she's a worshiper of Baal. She is a Moabite. She too has an understanding of a single true God. Now there's also a few other general assumptions we can make. Ruth did not marry a foreigner because she had lots of other offers coming to her. She did not come from a wealthy family seeking to make a great family connection with another family. By marrying into it. 
She was married to a foreigner, and it means that she comes either lowly on the family totem pole or from a family that has no wealth or influence. I say this so that we're clear and understand. When Ruth decides to stay with Naomi and go with her wherever she will, it's not like Ruth had a lot of other attractive options to fall into. But it still speaks to her character. Just as Abram left everything behind to go to a strange new place, to trust that God would provide, Ruth is leaving the things that she knows, the people she knows, the places she knows, and putting her faith and trust into the God and people of her late husband to follow and care for her mother-in-law. And she has no prospects of ever returning home. The next piece of the story brings us to what we read today in the text. Boaz is a well-known, respected, propertied, wealthy man. Naomi, when we hear anything from her, still comes off bitter, pitiful, a bit scheming and conniving. But she and Ruth have settled back amongst Naomi's people. Naomi won't venture past the house. So she relies on Ruth to go out and earn whatever it is that is to sustain them. It is one of the oldest rules found in Scripture. It's a rule as old as civilization itself. It spans across religions, beliefs, cultures, and races. There is an inherent responsibility to care for the poor and the downtrodden. There is a responsibility to care for the widows and the orphans. There is a responsibility to care and provide for the strangers and the aliens in your midst. In many respects, when we get to this time of the year and discuss stewardship, the word that gets tossed around a lot is tithing. Tithing is a word that we think we know what it means because we've always said we know that it means what it means. Well, if we truly read Scripture, we'll find that tithing means lots and lots of different things. And one of the terms of a tithe talks about the percentage of goods and harvests that you offer specifically to provide for these groups that were mentioned. The poor the downtrodden, the widows, the orphans, the strangers and aliens in our midst. Boaz notices the Moabite woman out gleaning in the field. Another sense of offering made to care for the needs of those who need. And asks about who she is. He learns that Ruth is providing for Naomi who had been married to one of Boaz's kinsmen. He makes special provisions for her and for Naomi. Now let us also face it, brothers and sisters, Boaz is not asking about Ruth because she's some poor, wretched creature out there in the fields. We can assume that she had a striking foreign beauty that turns Boaz's head so that he notices. And if we carry the story forward from this point, we find that Boaz does marry Ruth after he convinces all the other potential would-be suitors that it would not be worth their time because they'd also have to care for bitter Naomi. So we wholly recognize that it's not completely out of pure motives that Boaz provides extra care for Ruth. But it's to that point. Note, extra care. Extra care. Because before Ruth is given special treatment, Boaz has already made provision for Ruth and for Naomi 
for any others who happen along to be provided for freely out of, out of his wealth by being able to glean in the field. As Paul says, the point is this, one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. One who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your own mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and 8. Now, let's backtrack just a bit, shall we? Remember what we said about membership. We promise to support the church and the congregation with our prayers, our presence, our treasure, our service. We can assume there's a list of priority. Note what comes first. As Methodists, we begin our support of the church not with money, with prayer. We seek God to be involved with us and to communicate with us and us with God. It is one of the earliest things we can do. And yet, how often do we consider prayer as part of our stewardship? How often do we spend time in prayer for anything other than the ideas of simple needs? Aunt Mimi is ill. Uncle Lou needs a hip replacement. God be with them if it's in your will. It's not what the prayer is supposed to be. Of course, it's part of our prayer life. Pray for those who are in need of healing. But it's also part of our prayer life to celebrate the things God has done in our lives and the excitement of what God is going to do in our lives. And when I say lives, I equally mean community, family, church, country. There are a myriad, myriad of options you can insert. Methodists have an expectation of being present in worship attending to the sacraments, investing time into the study of scriptures, participating in one another's lives. Presence. Being present in the moment with other people. But did you hear the word at the beginning? It's an expectation. As Yoda says, there is no try. There is do or do not. As Methodists, we believe in giving our treasure, but also in giving of our time and our talent. We'll come back to treasure. This is the service point. Every one of us has something that we can contribute in the life of the congregation. Participation in teams or committees, involvement in the choirs, helping as greeters or ushers, serving coffee after worship, helping with children's programs, Sunday school, VBS, jam, youth group, the rock, participating in Sunday school or small group. You know, it's not about being young and hip to help out with youth group. It's about being present and caring. You know who the youth love more than any other person in this congregation? Carol Hackett, the most hip person in the room. Not so much, but the most caring, most loving, the one that came and made a presence. You know that participating in small group or class not only feeds you in study, iron is meant to sharpen iron. By your presence, you help and feed others. 
going back to treasure. In many ways, it's the easiest way to contribute. Any person can put any amount into a contribution as an offering. And yet, while we hate to discuss that part of our faith the most, be aware and open your eyes and your ears to the language of Scripture. Every story tells in some level of value as a component. It may or may not be overtly financial. At first glance, we do not recognize this story we read today as financial in nature. And yet, all those who harvest crop certainly know if you're going to provide for gleaners in the field, if you're going to set aside and intentionally miss harvesting parts of your field so that strangers and impoverished people can come and take of it freely, it is just the same as giving money directly out of your pockets. Next week we will be celebrating the consecration of our pledges for the coming year. Yes, it's overtly financial. Our world, unfortunately, runs on that model, and it's overtly financial. My concern as your pastor is all the aspects in how we practice our faith and how we live our stewardship with the whole of our lives. I pray that as we continue in this journey, in the months and the years ahead, you will hear that message come through often from this pulpit. It's not all about the money. In fact, it needs to be more about our personal commitment and our presence in one another's lives. But as for now, in this season of our giving, I also pray that you take note of that lesson of Boaz. His field was prepared and made ready and available for those in need before the pretty girl showed up. something to think about this week as we prepare for Consecration Sunday. Amen.